Welcome everybody on Zoom, welcome everybody in the lecture hall. So this week, we are going to study another data shape, data cubes. We've seen trees, we've seen tables, we've seen graphs, and now we are going to look at cubes. I need your attention, please, everybody. Thank you. So let's start with a bit of history of what actually happened in the previous in the previous decades. So at first, in the 1970s, we had the age of transactions. These are the good old databases with uh, PostgreSQL and so on. So the SQL databases with relational tables. And this is what people think of usually when they think about databases. These are the good old ones. And uh, we've studied what happened in the 2000s with big data. So with uh, MapReduce, Spark and so on, data lakes. So we actually uh, realized that a lot of new technologies emerge, in particular denormalizing data, looking into trees. Um, but actually something happened in between in the 1990s, which was the age of business intelligence. So what happened then is that people started to uh, want to do business analysis with data in order to, uh, to make informed decisions. There is a name for that. It's OLAP. Who knows or heard about OLAP? Okay. Who can tell me what this means? It's online analytical processing, right? So this is to be contrasted with OLTP, which is online transaction processing. Um, in fact, it's very similar in concept. I'm trying to give you the intuition of that. It's a bit the world of ETL and proprietary software on the left and the world of data lakes on the right. This is one way to look at it. So in short, in OLTP, these are the good old databases like PostgreSQL, uh, consistent and reliable re record keeping. This is what keeps the company running on a day-to-day -day basis. The inventories, uh, the orders, the, the what people put uh, in their online cart and so on and so on. So it's just record keeping. So you have very frequent updates. And on the other hand, OLAP is for database decision support, where you want to produce this fancy views for the C-level executives of the company with all kinds of charts and so on. Another way to characterize OLTP versus OLAP is that in OLTP, you have a lot of updates and writes to the database. It's normal, right? Your in inventories are evolving. People are placing orders on your website. New customers are registering. So you have very frequent updates. This is why you have all these normal forms and so on that were specifically made to account for these use cases, right? So this is what you, why you want your data in tables and in high normal form. In OLTP, on the opposite, it's lots of reads. The data is there, you put it there, then you don't touch it anymore, right? So you read, 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 read data. So this is why it might make you think also of MapReduce, Spark, HDFS, S3, and so on, on the right side, right? Lots of reads. You just put the data in the data lake and then analyze it. While on the left, you might think of uh, relational databases, but probably also of MongoDB, of Neo4j, that are also equipped uh, with uh, updates, uh, optimized for updates, right? So as you can see, originally people tended to think of OLTP as relational tables and OLAP for cubes. It's no longer so true today in the sense that you can also have OLTP for graphs, uh, OLTP for, uh, for uh, trees with MongoDB, and OLAP doesn't only apply to cubes because you can also do OLAP with trees. In fact, this is what we've been doing almost the entire semester when we've read collections of trees, right? This could be qualified as OLAP. Uh, but traditionally, people think of tables for OLTP and cubes for OLAP for some reason. Um, so no, on OLTP, you are interested in detailed individual records, like uh, the, the, all the fine grain, grain details of what the company is doing. On the right, you want these fancy looking reports that you give again to the CFO, the CEO, and so on, so that they see the evolution of sales, maybe for the investors and so on, right? So the summarized consolidated data also with historical information. In terms of patterns, that means that when you interact with OLTP, and again, I mean here PostgreSQL, Neo4j, MongoDB, and so on, you touch little data every time. You have small queries that just look at some portions of the tables here and there, but it's rarer that you are going to, to do a full scan over the database. In fact, this is why indices are super useful in, uh, in MongoDB, PostgreSQL, or Neo4j, because you can very quickly access the data, even if 
the total amount of data is enormous. On the right for OLAP, and this is also things we've been doing with Spark and MapReduce, you're looking at large portions of the data, a full scan, you might do many joins or you want to avoid the joins by denormalizing, which we've been doing as well. And you have few long heavy queries. You might remember with MapReduce, for example, that it can take hours or even days or even weeks until the query is actually completed. So that's a very big difference. And that means that for LTP, it's typically interactive, length less than one second. For the best systems, if you have a point query with an index, it's just a few milliseconds. One or two milliseconds, you get a result. OLAP is slow interactive in the sense that it exists in, uh, in business environments. You can have in your spreadsheet software, you can connect to a data cube, but then it's going to take a few seconds every time if you do it that way. And when you do analysis, it can even be hours or even days as well. Yes, we have a question. Be Just have a quick question when it comes to all TP and all up. Um, what if, for example, we have a website for, let's say, helping students with preparing for exams, and we want to provide them very thorough analysis based on their progress, how many exercises they've done, how many were correct, and so on. Uh, I suppose the user data makes sense to be an OLTP, but then if you want to provide for each user such in-depth analysis, should we also have a separate OLAP system, or how should that work? You're giving me the best possible transition for this lecture, because this is exactly what we are trying to deal with, because we, we will see that you want indeed to do OLAP like things on top of an OLTP database. And I will very shortly come back to that. This is a great question. It's exactly basically what we are going to talk about. So I will come back to your example uh, in particular. Right, so I'm just delaying the, the answer because this is coming. All right. Uh, another thing that characterizes OLTP because of the frequent updates is the very high normal forms. You want your data to be in third normal form, in voice code normal form, and so on. Why? Because of consistency, right? You want to do frequent updates without breaking stuff. OLAP or data lake, it's the opposite. You don't care about redundancy. Again, we've seen that with MapReduce and Spark. You denormalize the data. You don't mind if you duplicate it. In fact, in HDFS, we even have multiple replicas uh, and so on, right? So we don't care about redundancy uh, uh, and, uh, and breaking consistency. Why? Because we don't write so frequently, right? This is why we don't care. We just want to read efficiently. And when you read a lot, it, it's actually good to replicate the data because uh, you, you can uh, have uh, uh, simpler patterns of read. And I summarize, I'm not going to talk about that, but for offline reference, you can, this is food for thought about further ways to construct, to contrast OLTP with OLAP. So in general, OLAP is subject oriented. It has four adjectives actually that people commonly use. Subject oriented, because usually you have a very specific use case in mind. It can be web analytics, census data. Actually, this is how computers started at the end of the 19th century with IBM, for example. Uh, customers, data, science, with uh, analysis of data uh, at CERN, for example, sales data, which is the typically the textbook use case of OLAP is sales, uh, products, uh, events, and so on. So it's subject oriented. Second, it's time variance, because very often you want to look at past data, typically over the five to 10 years, past years, rarely beyond that. Uh, the reason is, there are several reasons, actually, it's based, based on experience. Uh, that past 10 years, actually, the data was so different that the cost of actually making it work with data that was looking differently uh, are, are just too high. So you just drop after 10 years. And also because you don't really care anymore, this is the typical business window that, um, that people have, right? But time is very important because you do want to actually go through time in years, in quarters, in months, and so on. Third, non-volatile, and this is again saying that you load the data in there, you access it, period, right? You just drop your data, uh, uh, as we will see in a cube, and you don't modify it anymore. It's frozen. Once the data is there, you just analyze it, but you don't actually touch it. There are no updates to the system. You don't change any values and so on. Integrated, and now I'm coming to the question that you've just been asking, because what happens in real life is that indeed you have on the left, this is all the data that you typically have in a company, right? You have the customer management system, you have the inventories, you have all sorts of databases, you might have files and so on. And in fact, in many companies, it's a lot of things, a lot of different technologies, a lot of systems. But in fact, first, it's so heterogeneous that it's very, very tough to actually 
analyze all of that data at the same time, right? Because you, you have to break the silos. It's all in silos. And if you want to connect to three or four different database systems at the same time, it's a lot of work. You need to install, to, to create a program that has the pilots for every database. And then it's very, very cumbersome to do. Um, but nevertheless, never, uh, 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 you know, you, you might have an existing database such as all of the exams and past solutions that you have in your system, which would be in an OLTP database. And so you might ask yourself, okay, why not query that data directly in, do, in order to do analysis, right? Um, on small scales, it might actually work. But imagine a company that has a lot of data in the OLTP system and where people every day and constantly every second, you have thousands of updates. Imagine an online shop and so on. Data is constantly changed. Imagine now that the CFO asks you to do a, some analysis on the database and you start connected to it and then launching a full scan query for hours on the system. A few hours later, you're going to have engineers and people knocking on your door asking what on earth you are doing, because this is slowing down the whole system, right? You're basically having this very heavy query, trying a, 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 a group buy, and suddenly all of the rest of the database is just unusable for other people. So this is the second reason on top of heterogeneity why you do not want, in most cases, at least when it's big, to directly do the analysis of, over OLTP. Now I'm using this as an example. It might be that in your case, the database is small enough that it wouldn't hurt, right? That it wouldn't slow things down. But if you think, if you think now you're a company, a big company uh, uh, thinking with very large databases, you simply cannot directly analyze on top of the existing database. So what do you do? Well, you just take it and pour it over somewhere else. That's called the data warehouse and materialize it. Uh, as a materialized view, and then you can work without disturbing the other people with this view to analyze the data, to create reports, you can even launch machine learning and so on. So again, this is the original data in all of these systems, but you pour it over as derived data into these materialized views. And typically, this is called data warehousing, the data you're going to have here, at least in the 90s and still a lot today, it's actually cubes. And we will see that this is for the business analytics, we want to have data organized in in cubes. All right, for whom is that clear? Okay, did I answer your question indirectly at least? Okay. Okay, now I put something in the middle called ETL that I think I already told you about. The ETL approach is when you want to load data uh, somewhere, right? So it means three things, extract, transform, load. So extracting means that you need to build gateways between the OLTP systems and the OLAP system. You might also need to extract from logs. It might be that you use Hadoop to do, to do that. It might be that you want incremental updates. Imagine you do it every night, but you only, only want to do the delta. Um, you want to trigger uh, some, uh, some, some pouring over to the, to, the, to the OLAP system. Then you transform the data. You want to clean it up. Probably it's uh, not very usable as it is in the system. So you want to do some cleanup and this is very costly and costs you uh, easily millions of, uh, of francs with uh, uh, typically when, uh, when uh, uh, Accenture and McKinsey jump in in order to help you do that. Um, or migration also is very costly. So you want to filter, to split, to merge, to join. You know, you just need to transform the data that was in the OLTP system and turn it into a data cube. Right. That's pretty much what you want to do. And again, there, it's, it sounds trivial, right? This is not maybe not the sort of things you spend a lot of time on in the computer science studies, but this is the real world. This is the sort of things you need to do. The data is just not clean. And in fact, in machine learning, um, this is a topic at the moment, the data centric AI, that if you don't work with clean data, then what comes out with machine learning or AI is just uh, not very high quality, right? So this is why it's cleaning up the data is paramount. And finally, you load the data into your OLAP system. Uh, you might want some integrity constraints, for example, positive numbers or matching numbers at some points. You want to build indices, but they will be specific to cubes. You might want to partition the data into multiple places and so on, right? So this is extract, transform, load, ETL. And in fact, many people use ETL as a verb. You ETL the data to your OLAP system. Okay. So what is the landscape today? Well, in the 90s, these were new companies, S-Base, Cognos, and so on. 
So they created new companies and actually the companies were so successful that at some point they were acquired by the big uh, companies like IBM, uh, Microsoft did their analysis services, but Oracle and IBM purchased SBase and Cognos and now it's part of their offering, right? SAP is kind of a, the fourth one. It's like the three musketeers that actually four of them. So SAP is also quite uh, popular to do this, uh, this kind of things, right? Um, all right, so this is this is pretty much the landscape, and you you will also find probably uh, uh, open source products. But typically, because this is very enterprise oriented, uh, uh, these are really the players that uh, that dominate the uh, the market. All right, so this was the introduction. This was the high level, just the motivation of things. Again, the idea is OLAP. You have very large portions of data. It takes time, and you don't update the data so frequently. Um, Today, for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to talk about cubes, right, which is the traditional, what traditionally people think when you do OLAP. But again, having in mind that some people could also include Spark, MapReduce, and so on, and also call that OLAP in the sense that it's really intensive, right? Okay, but today, OLAP will mean cubes. So what I will do is now I will split into two parts. I will first tell you about the data model. Just like the relational model had tables and rows and columns, and the relational algebra has selection, projection, grouping, ordering, and so on, and joins, Cartesian products, union, and so on. Well, it turns out that for cubes, we also have that kind of uh, verbs that we use. For example, we have slicing, dicing, pivoting, uh, rolling up, drilling down, uh, 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 aggregating, and so on, and so on. So we will look into all of these things that you can do on cubes, and you will see it's actually wonderful. And I actually redid all of the slides. I spent my Friday, Friday and my Monday redoing absolutely everything. I, I'm trying every year to find a, a better way to, to frame it. So I'll see how it, uh, how, it, uh, um, how it works, this new way of explaining it. So here's the model. So of course, it's not a relational table. Now it's a cube. It's a different shape, right? Uh, here I put a three-dimensional cube just because my brain knows who, how to see 3D, but 4D, 5D, it's, it's harder in more dimensions. Uh, so I'm using just three dimensions here, but in reality, it can be 10 dimensions, 20 dimensions can be much higher than just three. So basically, we have a cube. In that case, the three dimensions are the year, the product, uh, and the, uh, the location. And basically, that cube is made of these smaller cubes that are called facts. A fact is a number or a piece of information. In that case, it's seven, whatever that means. And that is associated with so-called dimensional coordinates that are basically the 3D coordinates in the cube, right? This might be 2022 for the year. This might be for the server sales when you're selling servers. And this might be the front uh, row of the cubes uh, for uh, Switzerland. And maybe you have Austria here and Germany over there, right? So these are the coordinates, these three, because it's 3D, so we have three coordinates that locate a small cube, and you have the number seven in there, which probably means that the company sold seven servers in Switzerland in the year 2022. And you have the same thing for all the other cubes, right? So you see, this was all obtained from the OLTP systems. We poured over the data and materialized it in this beautiful cube uh, of data, right? Who is following? Okay, this is a data cube, and this is called the facts. Typically, it's a fact, it's one little cell uh, over there. Okay. Then these three dimensions here, these are called dimensions or axes, depending how, how you, you, there are several ways to call them, dimension or axis. Uh, again, here I have three, but I can have more. So what kind of axes do we typically have in a data cube? Well, one axis can be where? The sales in Switzerland, the sales in Austria, the sales in Germany, the sales in the US, the sales in France, in India, in China, and so on and so on. Right? So all the sales, all the locations. Then you have who, for example, you have a team of salespeople and you want to see who has sold how, how much, right? So the teams and so on. So that can be who. Uh, which currency? US dollars, euros, uh, and so on and so on, right? So all the, 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 the currency, that's another dimension. You can also have what, what you are selling. Is it TVs, is it phones, is it uh, servers and so on. You can have when, was it last week, was it last year, was it this quarter and so on and so on, right? So these are just a few examples of dimensions, but in fact, limit is your imagination. You can have plenty more dimensions. You can have the, uh, the, the, the subsidiaries of a company. You can have some scenarios if you, if you do what if analysis, for example, and so on, right? So again, these are called dimensions or axes, right? It's also a popular term to call them axes, the axes of the cube, right? 
So here there's five examples already to show you that there can be more than three. Okay, now here's the problem. In reality, there can be more than three dimensions. I don't know what it looks like in four dimensions uh, or five. I, I, I'm not able to visually uh, understand that. And actually, probably very few people are. So what do we do in reality? We reorganize the little cubes. Instead of keeping the little cubes arranged as some hypercube, so hypercube would be the generic name for any dimensions, we just take the cells and just pile them on top of each other. So imagine I take all of these cells and I just build a huge pile, one on top of each other. What I get is a fact table. I just took the cells and every cell, every fact is on one row. This is, the, this is one little cell, one little cell, one little cell, one little cell, just piled up on, on top uh, of each other. And you see these are, this is what's inside. So these seven here would go in this last column. Seven would be somewhere here. And here you have the dimensional coordinates. For example, here we have the cell at the location Switzerland year 2022 and who is Peter. And the number inside that cell is 5,000. And I have, in that case, eight cells like that. Can anybody tell me how many dimensions this cube has? Just say it. I see three, exactly, because there are three columns, right? Uh, except for the last one, three. And what are, the, what are the dimensions of that cube? How much by how much by how much? Two by two by two, exactly. You see there's Germany and Switzerland, that's two. 21, 22, that's two, and Peter and Mary. So it's two by two by two, and two by two by two gives you eight. It's exactly eight. So it's, you see it's complete, basically. In fact, that's a much higher normal form when you have that sort of completeness, that all possible combinations are here. Uh, it's fourth or sixth, I don't know exactly which one anymore, but it's, it's a much higher normal form. But you probably notice that this is a cube, and when you pilot the cells on top of each other with the dimensional coordinates and values, you get a relational table. That's what it is. You, it turns out that you can express very naturally uh, uh, the, 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 what there is in a cube as a relational table with plenty of columns for the dimensions and one last column for the values. In fact, all the dimensions together, you can consider them a primary key that uniquely identifies the cell. And then in the last column, you have one value. Who is following? Okay, this is called a fact table. So we have the cube view, but again, very hard for human beings to visualize on higher dimensions. And we have the fact table view that is equivalent, but as a human being, it's much easier to understand. And typically this is what you can save as a CSV file and ship over, right? And people can open them in a spreadsheet software in order to, to, to manipulate them. Okay, now here I use these little pictures and uh, you know uh, displayed it fancily. This is closer to what looks like in reality. And here I, I have the financial report use case. I will talk a bit uh, at the end about XBRL and so on. This is typically the way you would see it, where you you add these little rectangular brackets here, the square brackets to say this is an axis. This is the axis location. It's equivalent for dimension. This is the axis period. This is the axis salesperson. This is the axis currency. So instead of the dollar over there, you prefer to, to specify US dollar here as a member. Uh, and uh, you see that all of the um, values here that the dimensions can have, right? This is the dimensions here. Typically, they are called members. So Switzerland is a member of the location axis, and Germany is another member of the location axis. 21, 22 are two members of the period axis, and Peter and Mary are two members of the salesperson axis, right? So putting these square bracket things actually is very helpful to always remember what you're talking about, right? To distinguish between what is an axis and what is a member, right? It's very verbose, but it's actually beautiful uh, to, uh, to, to visualize and understand, right? Uh, okay, so now we even have four dimensions, but you might notice that the last one is always USD, right? So uh, I will come back to how we can display it better because it's all the same value in the currency axis. Okay. But we have our cubes display. Yes, go ahead, ask a question. Quick question, are the rows, if I can call them rows, are they ordered in any way? Uh, you don't to need to assume any order here. Okay. Because okay. again, what did you do? You just took the cube and disassembled it and piled up the, it doesn't matter in what order it is. I see, I just saw it was sorted. So that's why I wanted to make That's sure. just because I'm Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> so you just like to have things organized. Yeah, okay. Um, 
somebody does it with art, you know, Ursus Verdi. Who knows Ursus Verdi? Tidying up art, you can look it up. It's actually very funny. He, he takes uh, pieces of art and just tidies it up uh, in, in something more ordered. Okay. Um, he's Swiss too. Okay. So um, let me now show you what we can do with cubes. The first thing we can do with a cube is slice it. Take a slice of the cube. It's like cooking, actually, baking a cake and taking a slice of the cake. So what it means to take a slice is you pick one dimension, one axis, and pick one member, and you only take that slice. For example, you only take Switzerland and take the slice out and look at the slice. This, this here is my slice of Switzerland. Right here I have, again, the entire cube with Germany and Switzerland, so there's two layers, and I only take the Switzerland layer, so of course I have less little cubes now, uh, and I have everything in Switzerland, right? This is called slicing right however you might have observed some things if you look at the columns is that it's always the same currency but this we already knew as before but it's always always the same location of course it is i sliced right so it's on purpose i actually took only switzerland so there is a better way to display this in fact you can take out the switzerland and usd uh, uh, um, columns and display them on top like this nicely uh, with the location that is Switzerland as a member and the currency that is USD. And now you can take out the columns and you just keep period and salesperson. You only keep those that vary, right? Who understands this is the same thing, right? It's just that now I display these, uh, these uh, constant columns separately. Okay, but now something fancy is going to happen because this is a cube too, right? It's a slice of my cube. How many dimensions does it have now? Just two, right? The, the other two are a slice, so this is no longer a dimension, right? Uh, in the in the sense of uh, it, um, uh, it, it's just sliced. So we have period and salesperson. But since we have two dimensions, as a human being, I understand two dimensions. That's a rectangle. It's a square. So why don't take take these four cells here and instead of displaying them in top of, on top of each other, let's put them back in a square, like this. We understand that this is the same. Right? I just reorganized things. There's Peter in 2021, 7,000, you see, that come from here. 2021, Peter, 7,000. I just reorganized these four cells in a two by two square, Peter, Mary, and 2021, 2022. This has a name. It's called dicing. We dice over the salesperson on the row and the, the time, the period on the columns. And again, what can I do? why can I do that? Because there's two dimensions left. Why is there two dimensions left? Well, I got rid of the other by slicing on USD and by slicing on Switzerland. So now I'm left with a slice that is two dimensional and I can display it in that way. This is also called the cross tabulation or a cross tabulated view when you have a dimension here, a dimension there and the rest as slicers. It's also called pivot table in spreadsheet software. You can actually literally Put that, open it as CSV in your favorite spreadsheet program, select it, click somewhere to activate the pilot, the pivot table, and then in your spreadsheet software, you can take salesperson, drag it all the way to the rows, take period, drag it all the way to the columns, take location, drag it over there, pull the drop down, select Switzerland, drag currency over there, click the drop down, select USD, and it's automatically going to compute the view for you. Whoever used that, in Excel or any other software. Okay, I recommend you try because this is very useful to actually understand how that works. We have a question over there. If you can go to the queue. Um, so, sorry, what exactly is the dicing now? Because slicing is getting rid of, of dimensions, but what was the dicing exactly? Because we just rewrote the table, right? Mm -hmm. So dicing is the idea that it's as opposed to slicing. So slice and dice is a common way to put that. Taking a slice means you only consider one single value and you take that slice. You ignore the rest. Everything that's not Switzerland is not there. Everything that's not USD is not there. Yeah. Dicing, you don't take just a slice. You still look at all the values. But what you do is that you put all the values on the rows for one dimension and all the values on the columns for the other dimension. This is dicing. And, and then you have... Uh, like this. It's like when you bake, you, you just cut into, into dices your, your, uh, your um, pasta, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, does it make sense? Okay, so this is dicing. 
Okay. Uh, now, this is a better view, and now I'm using a standardized view uh, that, uh, that is attributable to Charles Hoffman, who, uh, who is an accountant in the US. So I, I like to use this way of displaying things because I think it's very clean. So you see salesperson axis with Peter and Mary, and then you specify domain axis with 2021, 2022. Then you have the slicers over there. Okay. Now, how many dicers do you typically have? Typically, it's two. Why? Because that's what you have on a sheet of paper is two dimensions, right? So this is why typically you have two dicers and the rest as slicers. Dicer slicer is another name for the dimensions that you assign to slicing and to dicing, right? So here, location and currency would be called slicers and salesperson and domain, the axis would be called dicers, okay? Slicers and dicers. So you have to separate the dimensions between slicers and dicers, right? And you decide what you put on the cross tabulation as rows and columns and what you slice on. Typically, it's two. You can have just one, but then you're only using one dimension of your sheet of paper or of your screen. You can have three, but if there is a third one, typically it's going to be displayed as a tab. In fact, uh, in a spreadsheet software, you do have the tabs. You can see that as a third dimension of your spreadsheet, right? So you could have a third dicer, but again, that would just be a tab. Okay. So you have to, when you, you, you pick your view, and this is when you drag and drop things in your spreadsheet software, that you can assign what is a dicer and what is a slicer. Do we have a question on Zoom? As we just mentioned, cubes could be represented as a relational table. Slicing could be performed on relational table using select statements. Aggregation and different splaying could be implemented on relational data. Yes. Therefore, my question is that what does the new abstract model of cubes brings or why do we need cubes? Um, it is absolutely true that you can implement slicing as a select, as a selection. Um, in fact, this is what we'll see in the second part of the lecture, how to do it in SQL. Um, the reason why we don't just use the relational tables in SQL is that, especially if you talk with non-scientists, non-computer scientists, this here is a relational table. If you directly work, imagine there's millions of values there, and you try to manipulate directly the facts table without ever cross-tabulating. It's very hard to actually visualize things when you just, just focus on the facts table and just do everything as a relational model. When you visualize things as a cube, you actually get that kind of beautiful AI that you can drag and drop things and manipulate and, 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 uh, and change in real time because you really have your cube, you're pivoting it, you're, you're, you're taking slices, you're, this is very intuitive, especially to business people. Right, so this is this is the, the 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 why we have this model is that it's very easy to visualize and very convenient to use, um, and another reason is that this is a relational table, yes, but it is not any relational table. It's a highly normalized relational table with all possible combinations. So this is why we are beyond relational tables. We are really looking at cubes and looking at, at it as a cube just makes things much simpler to process. Does it make sense? But you're absolutely correct. It can be implemented on top of relational database. In fact, as you can imagine, there's a reason why the companies that actually bought these cube, data cube companies, they are all relational database makers, because of course they recognize that you can implement it all on a relational database. Okay. But these are extensions of the relational database that support these features. Okay, typically, by the way, when you use a spreadsheet, you can do it with a CSV file, but when you are in a company, the, the spreadsheet will actually connect to a data cube backend, and it's going to communicate with it, maybe with SQL or other protocols in order to display it for you. Okay, so let's do something else. How do we get rid of a dimension? Well, we can slice, but there is another way. We can also aggregate. So here I have a cube of three dimensions. I'm turning it into a cube of two dimensions, but that's because I merged everything along a dimension. I can sum everything. For example, this is my facts table, and I want to sum over the countries, meaning that everything that has the same period and salesperson and currency, I sum together, but I will be Switzerland plus Germany every time, right? So what I want to do is merge this and this, and merge this and this, and merge this and this, and merge this and this. I want to aggregate over my location. What do I get? 
world. Well, of course, Switzerland and Germany is not the whole world, but you get my point, right? So you can do it with uh, more countries. So now I added one plus five, for example, 1,000 plus 5,000 give you 6,000. And now I have, again, four values left, but these are aggregated values, right? I summed things over. And now, as you notice, the location is always the same value, the currency is the same value, so again, I can nicely display it there, but I change the color here, I put it on a dark purple, because the world is the whole domain, right? Domain is like a member, but it's a, it's, it's a top level member, it's basically the aggregation of everything, right? So now I have aggregated on the whole world uh, in US dollars, and I have my period and salesperson, but again, I can display it nicely like that, right? That's yet another cross-tabulated view, but the thing that changed compared to the previous view is that I didn't slice on the location, I aggregated my location all the way to the whole world, right? You could, some people view it as slicing on the world, right? You could also see it as a slice, but an aggregated slice, right, on the whole world. Okay, for whom is that clear? Right, I just aggregate it on the whole world. Okay. Now, how can we add totals? Imagine that I want to see the totals of all salespersons and the totals over all, uh, uh, all uh, periods. I'm not sure why I wrote domain here should be period. Um, so what you can add is a third line here, which is there's Peter and Mary, and you add all salesperson's domain, that's again the aggregation, and you have these fancy horizontal lines that just indicate that's the total, right? 10 plus 12 gives you 22. And then you do the same in the other direction, that's 2022 plus 20, uh, sorry, 21 plus 22. So you have 10 plus 12 gives you 22, and 10 plus 6 gives you 16. Right, so the 16 is for all times, but only Peter. 22 is all salespersons, but only 2021. And here you have the grand total that is the whole world, the whole period, and the whole team. Right. So this is the uh, the, the 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 sum of absolutely everything. In fact, this is your whole cube. This is the sum of all the whole cube. But you see what we did here. Here we only looked at the whole world. But for all times, we look both at the individual values and at the total over there. Here we have the individual values and here we have the total. Do you notice here on the rows, I display it with a horizontal line like that, that indicates it's a total. Here I use an L shape, right? So this means that all times is over 2021, 2022. But then I have my L shape that allows me to display this as a total. It's just a, a very visual way of uh, visualizing a hierarchy, right? It's a flat hierarchy in that case because there's only just a flat list of members and then a total, the domain. But in general, you can have more complicated hierarchies, right? So these are the ones that I showed you before, right? So here it's flat. You have all salespersons with a flat list, all times with a flat list. But imagine for countries, you can have something more hierarchical, just not flat, because you can have like Zurich, Geneva, and Interlaken in Switzerland, Berlin and Frankfurt in Germany, Switzerland and Germany in Europe, uh, uh, Delhi in India, Beijing in China, India, China, Asia, then Asia, Europe. Well, of course, it's not the list of all 200 plus countries, right? But this is just to show you the spirit. So in general, the new message here is dimensions are organized generally as hierarchies of members, hierarchies. It's a tree, in fact, you probably see a tree here, right? So how do you display more generalized? So here, that's the flat version. If you have more complex version, it's just L shapes in L shapes in L shapes. Again, it's like a Lego game, right? So you see here, Zurich, Geneva, Interlaken, and then you have Switzerland, that is all of them. And with this L shape, this is where I put my total for Switzerland. Then you have Germany, Berlin plus Frankfurt. Here is my total. Then you have Europe, that is all of that. And with the, my L shape, I have here the colon for the total. Then again, Didi, I just have one just because you know my, my PowerPoint is not uh, infinitely stretchable. Uh, so you see the L shapes and so on. Then I have the whole world again an L shape. And then I'm indicating that's the location axis. For whom is that clear? What's going on here? So we just aggregate in subtotals and subtotals and subtotals uh, at all the levels, right? And you see that for the period, I just added up all, all times, right? But I made up the data, of course, but yeah, that's the idea. Okay, now this is for the columns. The L shapes are for displaying a hierarchy of dimension. 
on the columns. How do I do it on the row? It's going to be boring on the rows because that looks much more like a financial report <laughs> that you just say, okay, there's Zurich, Geneva, Interlaken, and then you have a subtotal for Switzerland, then Berlin, Frankfurt, subtotal for Germany, and then subtotal, but more important. So you put it in bold and add an extra double line. Then you have Delhi, India, uh, Beijing, China, and so on. And then the grand, grand, grand total, you put it in extra big font, bold and uh, triple line and so on, right? So you see the idea here, it's not a matter of display uh, and on the rows, you, you typically in financial statements, so this is what a balance sheet or an income statement would look like, right? So again, for the columns, you use these L shapes and for the rows, you use indentation and uh, uh, different fonts for the subtotals by importance. For whom is that here? This is very easy to understand, right? And now you probably understand why with a relational with a relational table, you cannot do that. You can only do these visuals because you interpret that as cubes and because you know that there are hierarchies in the dimensions, okay? Now, what can we do? Let's do something new. Let's roll up. What is a roll up? Well, imagine a curtain that you just pull it and, uh, and just uh, pull it up, roll it up. So let's roll up. Rolling up means I ignore the smaller levels. Let's remove the cities and just look from the country level. There you go. Let's roll up again a little bit more and look at the continents level. Let's roll up even more and look at the whole world. This is called rolling up. And in fact, now since there's only one column left, I can even put it there. Right. And then I basically have a, a di only di one dicer. Now it's salesperson and I don't have a column dicer. The opposite is called drilling down. You drill down by looking more fine grain and you roll up by, by uh, removing levels. For whom is that clear? Roll up. Awesome. So you see, it's very visual. And again, you cannot see these things directly with a relational table. You really need that abstraction. Okay, we've done a lot of progress. We are actually done with the um, logical model. So now you know what a cube is. You know that there are three ways of looking at a cube. There is the way that most humans cannot do beyond three dimensions, meaning a hypercube. There is the facts table where you pile up the cells on top of each other as a relational table. And there is the cross tabulated view, also called pivot table in the spreadsheet software, where you have two dicers typically and the rest as slicers on top. And then you can, of course, play with that by drag and dropping dimensions, changing what you slice, changing what you dice. You can roll up and, and so on and so on. Okay. So we are soon going to have the break, but maybe I can introduce the next part about the physical implementation. And now we are coming back to the question that was asked on Zoom. How do we implement that? Turns out there are several ways. And the first way is called roll up. That's a nice pun, roll up and molap. So roll up means relational all up, meaning that you implement your fact table as a relational table. So this is what's called roll up. And this is what typically is done in, by IBM, Microsoft, Oracle. The other way is called molap. MOLAP means more, I think it's for memory, memory OLAP. It's basically, it basically means that you're not using any relational database for that. You basically re-implement the whole thing natively as a whole native system that directly manipulates cubes, right? A bit like Neo4j did it for graphs, right? You don't have any relational database behind. Um, so this is called MOLAP. But today I don't want to push too much new material. So I'm gonna focus on MOLAP because you already know SQL, you already know relational databases. So this is why we're just going to do roll up. So this is not new, right? We know that a fact table is made of plenty of columns, one per dimension, and then the value at the end that, uh, that is the content of, of the cell, right? And every row in there corresponds to one cell of the hypercubes. Now you should know that some people have an extended version of that where you have multiple values columns. Uh, it it's called a measure. And an example of that could be in, the, in a financial statement. You could be looking at the profit. You could be looking at the revenue and so on. So these are different things you measure. But as it turns out, this is equivalent. Why is that equivalent? How can it be? Well, because you can actually turn one into the other. And the trick that's called pivoting and unpivoting. In fact, if you indeed have several measures in there, you can turn that into another dimension that can take the values revenues and profits. And you just put that in, the, in a new dimension column and you're back to one fact per row. So you see there's eight here and eight there. It's exactly the same values. It's just that we turned the measures into another dimension, also called concept by some people. For whom is that clear? Okay, so this is why from now on, I'm gonna consider there's only one measure 
and one single column, knowing that you can actually easily go from one to the other. So typically, if you want to store OLAP in a relational database, you can do it with a star schema, meaning that you have your facts table in the center with your dimensions, and you have so-called satellite tables that contain extra information about the dimensions. For example, you can have a customer dimension, and in the satellite table, you're going to have extra info like the address, uh, the phone number, and so on. If you want to really push it because you love normal forms and, and you want your satellite tables to be normalized, then this is called the snowflake schema. You can uh, sorry, normalize the, uh, the uh, satellite tables. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it looks like a snowflake, right? So this way it's called snowflake. OK? And basically, in a snowflake schema, you basically join. You have to join the tables. That's the facts table interlaken. Then in the first level of the snowflake, you have interlaken here that is in Switzerland. And in yet another, because you normalized it into separate tables, Switzerland is in Europe and so on. I think that's enough for the first hour. Let's take a break, right? And after the break, I'm going to show you how you can do these things using SQL. It's actually quite nice. So I'll see you in 15 minutes at quarter past three for the continuation. Thank you.